It is absolutely wonderful to look out and see all of you here. Thank you so much for sharing some of your evening time with us on a Wednesday uh, in a very uh, tricky time in the quarter where things start to feel a little bit hectic, right? For everybody, students, staff, and faculty alike. But welcome, we're so glad you're here. My name is Maisha Wynn. I am the co-founder and co-director of the Transformative Justice and Education Center in the School of Education, along with Tori Wynn, and also the Chancellor's Leadership Professor. Um, I'd first like to just get a sense of who's in the building. If you are an undergraduate student here at UC Davis, can you do a show of hands? Woohoo! Yes! Let's give it up for our UC Davis undergrad. If you are a master's or PhD student in on campus somewhere in one of the units, raise your hand. Nice! Can any of our UC Davis staff raise their hands? Staff members, yay! Um, if you are a professor in the School of Education, can you raise your hands? Yay! Woohoo! Do we have faculty from any other units in here? Okay, yay! <laughs> yay, thank you for being here. Um, we are so grateful. Um, oh, also I should say, do we have any preschool or elementary school students in the building? Elementary school, preschool, up here? All right, great. And how about some of our community partners and stakeholders who just hold it down in the community for us? Thank you, our educators. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, we just want to do um, some acknowledgments and we want to introduce you to some of our team members before we formally introduce Matua Ra and Helen Bowen. Um, we uh, at the TJE Center every year have an amazing group of practitioners and residents who we bring in. These are um, teachers and educators, people who work with nonprofits, who do transformative justice work. We are so excited that our 2019, 2020 practitioners and residents were able to join us today. And so they're here, I'm gonna ask them to stand. Um, Roxana Duenas, can you please stand? Jorge Lopez and Eddie Lopez. They are educators, okay. They are educators at Roosevelt High School in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. They teach social studies and ethnic studies. They gave a stunning presentation today to our undergrads around their work with using restorative justice in ethnic studies classrooms. And we are so happy that you said yes and that you're here and that you are spending time with us this year. And they will be doing a public workshop in the winter. So as soon as we have the dates for that, we will make sure that we publicize that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we also have our partners from St. Paul Public Schools. We have Becky McGammon and Cara Beckman. Can you please stand? And St. Paul Public Schools in Minnesota is doing an amazing job introducing restorative justice in their schools. They have restorative justice leads at several school sites. And so Becky and Cara are essential to training them and supporting them and making sure that they have the tools that they need to do this really important work. So we're so happy that they made the trip. Um, we also want to make sure that we introduce our team. Um, can members of our team stand as I introduce you? We have our community college intern, Raina Velasquez. We have um, first year doc student and our grad student researcher, Hodari Davis. We have another one of our doctoral students, Amber Hernandez. And even though he's in sociology, we, you know, borrow him a good bit. We have our GSR, Jeremy Prim. And I want to acknowledge Vanessa Segundo, who is not feeling well today, but she is one of our GSRs and an intricate part of this uh, community. And then I'd really love for you to meet our new practitioner, I'm sorry, our new program coordinator for the TJE Center. Uh, she just joined us on Monday. Her name is Jocelyn Hernandez-Bautista. 
And I just wanted to share a couple things about Jocelyn since she just joined our staff and joined our team. Uh, Jocelyn, I found out that this is very important. She was born in the South Bay on the east side of San Jose because when I put east side San Jose on Instagram, all these people started hashtagging ESSJ. I had no idea. So uh, so they people are proud and I love that and I'm glad I added the east side. I didn't just put San Jose. Um, she calls that her home and she grew up attending public schools in the South Bay. Uh, and graduated from Eastside Union School District. And she earned her bachelor's degree at UC Santa Barbara in sociology and black studies. And her master's degree with some of our dear friends and colleagues at the University of San Francisco in the Human Rights and International and Multicultural Education Program. I want to share this quote from Jocelyn about uh, how she entered this work. Uh, she wrote, my passion for transformative justice education comes from my own experiences growing up in a Salvadorian immigrant household as a poor queer brown woman navigating through the UC system and other educational institutions. And I think that that's so important and we're so glad and grateful that she's here doing this work with us. Thank you for being here, Jocelyn. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to also acknowledge our Dean Lauren Lindstrom. Um, she's way back over there in the corner. And Dean Lindstrom has been incredibly supportive of the work that we're doing at TJE and really supportive of all of the work of my colleagues who are interested in equity-oriented work. And she doesn't just say that, but she really backs it up with her support of us, of our programs, of our programs of research and the kinds of work that we're trying to do. And it's really hard to do that work if you don't have leadership that supports that work. So I would like to acknowledge and thank her for her, her support. And now I'm going to bring Tori to introduce our guest. Thank you, Maisha. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is emotional because anytime you have Matura and Helen in your midst, in your presence, uh, it just brings some type of personal emotion that you feel between them that spreads to everyone. So I'm going to try to stay calm. Uh, so you have the written bio, and then you have the live bio. Matura and Helen, it's not only about their written bio, because we requested a written bio from them. And when I say it was like a sentence or two, <laughs> you talk about humility, that's Helen and Matura. But I want to start off with their live bio. Today, we had opportunity to sit in circle uh, with our colleagues and friends from throughout the, the country, well, throughout the world, uh, thanks to New Zealand. Uh, and the last question we ask, asked ourselves was, what does restorative justice mean to you? We talked about community. We talked about relationships. We talked about accountability. We talked about people. We talked about our history. And it got to me, and I mentioned relationships, I mentioned community. But when I think about restorative justice, I think about Helen and Matura. I think about their relationship, when you think about New Zealand and its history. And I'm sure Helen Matura will talk about its history. But Matura last night in our conversation for about an hour, we talked about the colonized and the colonizer. And what is that space in between? The colonized and the colonizer. And he mentioned that there's a space that we have to work towards. So when I look out in this room, this is that space. And I think about Helen Matura, I think about that space in between, the hard work. And that's what I think about when I think about restorative justice. So let me just be brief. Helen Bowen is a New Zealand restorative justice advocate criminal attorney, youth advocate, and drug court lawyer. In 2000, with her husband, Jim Bowick, she was contracted by the then Department of Courts to provide training for 80 community restorative justice facilitators in four courts in New Zealand. Since, since then, she has provided RJ training services nationally and internationally, including working uh, with police in London and community groups in Northern Ireland. She continues to provide professional development and supervision uh, with Auckland RJ provider groups and specializes in the area of health and safety RJ conferences and works safe New Zealand prosecutions. She also works with schools on a case-by-case -case basis when RJ is needed. So when I read that line, 
uh, I just thought about schools must be really hard to work with. <laughs> uh, she has a long-standing interest in biculturalism and working with uh, Maori uh, youth and adult offenders in the criminal justice arena. So of course we have to figure out how to add something to it because uh, Helen and Matura, they're simple, they're short, but when they start to present, it's over. But we have five questions for Helen. If you could choose the theme song, one theme song, what would it be? Forever Young. <laughs> if you could put a book in a young person's hands, what would it be? Man searching, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Who are some of your biggest heroes? Maya Angelou, Victor Franco, and Martin Luther King Jr. Words of wisdom in one or two sentences. Kindness is not weakness. Choosing forgiveness liberates the hatred that can grab hold of you and not let go. Have the courage to choose forgiveness. Thank you, Helen. Matura, uh, tribal affiliations with Napoi Tainui. Matura is the alcohol and other drug treatment courts for Paora Na, Pillar of Healing, Kotra Takanga, advisor and recovery role model, and innovation of the AODT courts in New Zealand. Rob brings his extensive lived experiences of recovery and with his in-depth knowledge of the Maori uh, role. He has worked in the addiction se sector uh, in the clinical cultural facilitator, practitioner, and advisor for 25 years and is passionate about the well-being of people. Matura and Helen, thank you for coming to UC Davis, California, to be with us and to teach us about New Zealand and what it means to be RJ practitioners and just lovers of people. Welcome. Can you do my four questions? Your four questions? I don't I feel left out. Huh? I feel left out. Okay, let, let me, let's, your four questions. On spot. If you can choose one theme song, you don't have your guitar, do you? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you could choose one theme song, what would it be, Matora? Freedom to be. Freedom to be. It's a composed song, original. He wrote it. It's a song. <laughs> <laughs> It's his song. <laughs> Is that what you've been singing this whole time? <laughs> oh, okay. If you could put a book in a young person's hands, what would it be? Ruby's dead. Ruby's dead. Ruby is a is a seven, eight year old, and it's about Ruby's dad. Mm. And he's an alcoholic. Matura, who are some of your biggest heroes, heroines? My 15-year-old grandniece, she's my hero at the moment because she's recovering from an aneurysm that struck her at the height of her schooling where she was a A student and an A sports person and it came out of nowhere and has taken her almost to death. Uh, but she's sustained, and now she's healing really, really well. She's my hero. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I should ask this, because maybe this is what your presentation is about. <laughs> Words of wisdom, one to two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Eight words. Ooh. You keep what you have by giving it away. Mm. <laughs> Matura, Helen, welcome. If you would allow me for a moment to greet you in my mother tongue, I would be greatly humbled. He honore he korore ki te atua. 
he mau ngārongo ki te whenua, he whakāro pai ki ngā tāngata katoa. Translated, Glory be to God, the God of your understanding. Let there be peace upon the earth and goodwill to all mankind. Tuarua, ka mihi ki ngā mana whenua no konei. Koera te ingoa o te iwi, Patwin, te nā koutou, te nā koutou. I take a moment to acknowledge the people of this land, the Patwin people, the Patwin tribe. I was very blessed to be directed to the memorial rock and to take time there and to speak to your river and to your trees and to your memorial rock. Thank you for the honour of allowing me to do that. Nō reira kā nui te mihi atu ki a koutou, ngā mana whenua nō konei. A hurirauna, hurirauna ki a koutou mā. I want to just take a brief moment to acknowledge and to honour Professors Maisha and Tori Wynne for bringing us to your land and for treating us like royalty. We are in your debt. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Hurirauna ki ngā reo, ngā mana, ngā kāranga rangatanga. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. To all your histories, your bloodlines, your genealogies, I take a moment to honour you in your history back to the source. Ko te mea nui, ko te aroha. So what is the greatest thing that we often talk about? It is love. It is love. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. At this time, we're going to sing you a waiata. Actually, I'm going to get you to participate. And so, uh, Helen, hello, my Helen. Kia koe te honore, ka nui te mihi atu ki a koe. Mai tō tainga mai ki Aotearoa in New Zealand. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe. I also want to take a moment to honour um, His Honour, the judge that's sitting here up front. We, we met perhaps a couple of years ago. He came to New Zealand to the court that I... Um, sit in alongside our team and um, what a wonderful, wonderful moment to see you again, Your Honour. Kanui to me. So here's the participation. You just repeat. We'll start, you repeat. Okay? It goes like this. And we're going to talk about three things. These three things are faith, hope, and love. The greatest, of course, is love. So that's what we're going to be singing about. So here we go. <laughs> Te manawa, te manawa, tu manapo, o te menui, ko te aroha, aroha is love in my language. Kia ora tātou. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Helen now. He's just going to kick us along. <laughs> tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Can you hear me? No. So we'll Is that better? A little bit. Okay. 
Um, just, I just wanted to also say that thank you for all for coming tonight. And I wanted to say a particular thank you to Maisha and Tori. And how we got to know one another is quite a wonderful story because they were in Auckland, New Zealand for another engagement and came to look at our drug court. Um, Ra and I have been working in that drug court for the last seven years. They came last year uh, and were able to sit in on the drug court and then sat with us and chatted and we became good friends and then um, we started writing to one another and we wondered if there was some work that we could do together. And, um, and today is in a way a product of, of that moment and we've all been inspired by the coming together of, of us um, as people, but particularly wonderful that we can share it with you and share the work that um, they all do here at this university and it's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to be here for both of us. Um, so tonight, um, I just will, we've done we've done the welcomes, um, and what what I wanted to what we wanted to give you was a little bit of a picture of the work that we've been doing. Um, just by way of, we're actually reversing that just to make things completely confusing. But I'm going <laughs> I'm going to talk about restorative justice for a little while and. Um, I've, I guess, been embedded in restorative justice practice for quite a long time and over the last seven years what I learnt from Ra and the practice in drug court was that things could be done in a different way and Ra will obviously talk about his role and there'll be um, a documentary which will show you in a better way how the participants actually experience the court. But for me as a practitioner I've learnt so much in the last seven years about what we can do better. And I guess um, we're able, we've been able to work together in that space and that's been a huge privilege for me because I've learned so much more about the work that I do with Māori and what I can definitely do better. Um, so t tonight I'm just going, you'll know some of this material because uh, I think everybody here has been learning about restorative justice. Um, so it, essentially that is a definition and it's not the definition you'd ne necessarily use in schools. So that definition is, is it's a legal definition. Um, these slides I can send to you later, but it's one that we've used over the years. Um, and I think it is quite a good definition. Um, in schools, when you're working with young people, it, it's, um, it's in some ways it's relevant, but I know that the work that I've done in schools is, is it's, a lot of, it's a simpler process and you're gonna be having a restorative conversation or children are um, with, with an adult intervening. So to some extent, um, it's not relevant to the work you do, but it has helped define the work we do in courts. Um, so what, what I, a lot of this work is just what I have thought about as a result of uh, meeting Ra and, and working out where Māori fit in the criminal justice system. And um, although I've been working for a very long period of time with Māori within that system, I haven't, I've never really understood um, what, what the difference is between, say, a European form of restorative justice and a Māori form of restorative justice. So the, where, where there's a breach and when there's been something happen um, for a Māori offender or a Māori victim, largely it's about addressing that breach and there's been there's an imbalance that's created. Um, Ra will speak more about Te Whari Tapawha um, in, his, in his speech um, and, and he, he will go on to um, tell you about that. But um, and what I will do at the end of the speech is talk to you about an actual case that happened and you'll get a, a more clear sense and a more clear picture of what that means. Um, and the, so the rest of this is largely about what I see as a restorative process but with, a, I guess, a bicultural look at what we could do better. So um, from a Māori pers perspective, when um, a, an offence happens or something happens to a victim, if an apology is said um, on the ancestral land and in the presence of that person's ancestors, that is going to have more meaning. So when we have a restorative process on a marae, which is the ancestral land, um, that is able to happen. So victims um, are able to have that apology given in the presence of not only their family but their, their previous ancestors. And that, in, in the doing of that, what I understand is that that creates more safety, creates more safety for everybody. 
Um, and what also has happened in that space is the offender can take responsibility in the presence of their family, but also in the presence of their ancestors. Um, this, this apology is a demonstration of accountability. We need accountability and restorative justice, and you'll all be aware of that as educators. Essentially, what victims need to know, and you will know all of this, they want to know what happened, why it happened, and why it happened to them. And often people think, oh, it's going to happen again, and that same person is going to do that to me again. So those are sort of the sorts of things that you can have a conversation about. When, when I'm teaching, I'm teaching facilitators about the role, so this is largely practical, what I'm, the information I'm giving you now, but if you're going to have a Māori process, obviously you need a Māori facilitator, and these are things that the New Zealand government is coming to terms with. But and within our drug court environment, every offender has to go to restorative justice prior to them graduating the court. And that may take the form of meeting with a victim, but if the victim is not inclined to meet, the offender then meets with a panel of Māori elders. And so um, that, that process, um, it, it's a cultural process, it's an accountability process, and it's a process whereby the Māori elders can really paint the picture of what the result of that offending has been for the offender. But the wonderful thing about drug court also is that nearly 18 months down the track into their recovery within the court, they are a transformed human being. So they can look back at those behaviours as a person who's very much into their recovery and they will look at that offending in a totally different light. So uh, when you're, when, as a facilitator, when you're asking family what they need in this process, you get them to define what's going to make it restorative for them, not the other way around. So these are all things I've learned through listening. Um, where the process takes place is important. If it's some people um, will just have a process in a community centre, I would never hold that process in a victim's home um, for safety reasons. And, but if if, and if if and everybody agrees that it should be on the marae, then that's that's the ancestral home of the offender or the victim. Then that's where it would be. We're always checking, always checking in with people about comfort. Um, and, and particularly the comfort and needs of the victim. If, there's a, if, there's, um, if it's not clear about which way you go forward, you always defer to the, the Māori process, which is known as tikanga, or the right way. Um, and then we always defer to the victim. So that would be very similar to the work that you do in schools. Um, obviously, pre-conference, all that preparation that goes into a restorative process is the most important part of the process. Um, and here, these are just some steps that are taken. Um, we, we always need, we talk about confidentiality and I'm not sure how that works for you in schools, but simply we ask people to hold the information confidential. In court, the judge will refer to the report, but then that particular document is not confidential, but the conversations that they have is. So people are free to say whatever they like essentially in that space. Um, we tell them that it's going to be shared with the court, but only the outcome. Um, all those just things like t date, time and venue are discussed. Um, and when cultural issues come up, they must be dealt with sensitively. Um, the, this difference, the difference between the two parties is something that the facilitator must think about um, and they must communicate respectfully in that environment. Um, we, so if, if we weren't sure about whether it's going to be culturally sound or not, we seek advice. So that's simply how it happens. Um, just more information about um, building that relationship. So relationships is at the absolute heart of the whole process. So restorative justice from the moment it starts to the conclusion, it's all about relationships. So you as a facilitator um, are building that relationship both with the victim's families and the offender's families. So all about you and particularly at the beginning and making feel, people feel comfortable. Um, you've obviously got to give them information about what restorative justice is about. You're learning about what happened when you're talking to them, so you're getting a clear picture of the offending. Um, you explain the process, and if they would like to have that on the marae, then there are steps taken about that. Um, if, as, as I said, if there's a difference between what we would do in a Western world and then what a tikanga process is, that is the process that happens, and we always seek advice on that.
that um, building the relationship, you've obviously got to build a relationship, a good relationship with the offender and the victim. My, my inclination, inclination is talk to the offender first because then you know what you're dealing with when you're passing on information to a victim. So you really get to know the offender. They get to know you. We have two facilitators, so we're both able to talk and, and understand the difference um, between the two and the relationship. We always talk about confidentiality in that pre-conference meeting because it's important for them to know that all of those discussions prior to the conference are confidential. Um, we also would we would discuss any tikanga process at that at that early stage, and we would ask if that's what they wanted. So once again, happy to share these slides. So what I see the difference between a Western process and a Maori process is that. I think it's a therapeutic response to the offending for both the victim and the offender. And it should, a normal Western RJ process should be, but I've seen it happen in a lot more of a therapeutic way with, with, when it's on the marae. And I'll give you that example before I finish. So when I say there's, a, there's an opportunity to provide cultural safeguards, there's some things that are put in place in that meeting. For example, an apology in front of a, a victim's ancestors. That, that provides cultural safeguards for those people, and that's how they've articulated it. So there's also, when an apology is given, there's a collective responsibility that happens on a marae. So not only is the offender held responsible, but all of their family members feel a sense of responsibility for that offending too. And in that sharing of responsibility, I think there's a, quite a comfort that the victim gains from that, that, knowing that all of these people surrounding this offender are people who care and who, and who don't want it to happen again and who are going to do their best to make sure it doesn't happen again. So I think there's a lot of insurance, if you like, for a victim to come to a meeting where the offender's got lots of support and those people are saying, I should have done better. I should have supported that offender in a better way. And one example I can recall on a marae once when a couple of young guys had beaten up two police officers, they came back after a prison sentence onto the marae and the elders said, we didn't do our job. So that's the kind of thing that happens um, when, it's, when it's safe and when it's the right process. So the other thing, by going onto a marae and having those apologies given, is there's that restoration of the relationship, and that's um, it's a very important thing. And Ra can speak a little bit more about mana um, when he gives his presentation. So it is, it's, it's a therapeutic response, it's a safer response, and people are asking um, and what's going to be the appropriate response to this offending in a culturally safe way. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to speak about a case that happened just before we came to Japan uh, in August. So it's a relatively recent case, and it's a very, very sad case. Um, and I happened to meet the parties because I was the duty lawyer at court when this came to court at the very beginning. And um, strangely enough, I knew the parties. So they asked me, they didn't have a lawyer, and they asked if I could become involved. Um, and so it was a 77-year-old man had been had flown to the Philippines, flown back to Auckland. He was he lived about two hours out of town, and he chose to drive after his long flight home. And uh, he, two women were killed: a grandmother and her her daughter. So it was a total tragedy. Um, and at the hospital. What happened was the daughter went to visit her dad who had, was also injured and the women were at the hospital um, and they didn't recover. And the daughter came over to the family who were grieving for their, their relatives who were dying and said, that was my dad, this is what happened. And the family didn't know anything about, they knew their relatives were in hospital, they hadn't been given any of that information. So it was a, it was a total tragedy. Um, but with the elders, when, when we did have restorative justice, the elders said, because you came over and you talked to us, that made things okay for us, because we understood what was happening. It was a terrible, terrible time for everybody, but they found that to be hugely important and very helpful and healing. So unbelievably throughout the the whole time between say four um, court attendances by the offender 
the victim's family would come and accompany the offender, so they would support him through all those hearings. Then when they had the meeting on the marae, the sister of the woman who was killed sat and held the hand of the offender and her daughter. Um, and he was, able, he was able to explain everything about what happened. So what they required from him was an apology in front of their ancestors. And, and once that had happened, they said the balance was restored. Um, photographs were presented to him of those who died and the grandchildren were brought out from time to time just to have a look at the photos and to hear the apology. So a very moving ceremony um, and um, wonderful, wonderful people on both sides. Um, so I guess the, differ the difference between all of this is that what I see happening in that process, nothing's, nothing's ever going to change that accident. But the, the connections um, that they had before the accident were enhanced somehow or other by having this good, clear healing process. Um, the, so victims were able to start and end the process with a Māori prayer. Um, they, they spoke about the contact they'd had throughout. So for once, for whatever reason, the father and um, husband was with the offender all the way through the process. He found that a helpful thing. Now, not, not many people I know could do that, but he decided that that's what he needed to do. So when I met them each time, he was there with the offender. So he's the victim and, and the offender, and he would introduce us. And he's also spoken court. So um, I think that it, from what I was, I wasn't actually at the conference, but from what people have said to me, it was one of the most um, moving things ever. And the victim's family were particularly heartened by what had happened, as well as the offender's family. So it seems like everybody, everybody gained what they needed to, although it's very sad and, and it's still very difficult. One of the interesting things um, at the end of all of this is the judge just went, I don't need to do anything more. So he didn't want to mess with it. Uh, and he, he, there's wonderful sentencing notes, but he, as he says here, this family demonstrates an extraordinary insight into the process of repairing harm and going about it in such a wonderful way. And I haven't, in the, all the years I've seen restorative justice, I haven't seen anything like that and what what was wonderful in a way was that it was a European offender and a Māori family, and the Māori family were able to show to the European family, this is, this is what it looks like, this is what we need to do, and things are going to be a bit better now because we've been able to do our process. So the judge, needless to say, didn't, although he had an obligation legally to, cre to create a sentence, all he did was disqualify the 77-year-old man. No further penalty was imposed. And as he said, it would be wrong for me not to give weight to what the victims have said in this process. Um, so, yeah, I think that I know it's a very difficult note to end on, but for me, I was truly heartened by this process, even though it's very difficult and it's a very difficult subject matter. But it really showed to me what can happen if we take those steps to really listen to what victims want. Kia ora. And as we wait, I just want to make a connection for our center, TJE, in New Zealand. One of the reasons we went to New Zealand is because uh, restorative justice is a, it's, a, it's, it's known by the indigenous folks, so the Maori uh, and, and New Zealand. We wanted to go and be connected to the source. And so we got a conference out there and we were able to connect with Arturoa and his community. And for two days he drove us up in the mountains, around town, mm -hmm. and just connected us to his people to his community. And so for us who practice RJ in the US within the schools, we had an opportunity to really uh, be connected to the source of New Zealand. So thank you for that. And in the US we do it within the schools and in other areas, but to see you and your community. It was a blessing for our center here in the US. How's the sound? Can you all hear? Can you all hear?
kahaki te whakatika i ngā marotanga, kia māta, kia mārama, hoki ngā perikitanga. You know, when you're able to pursue that your people go into the court, I think you would be a high rate of Māori. I was looking at prison because I've been in the judicial system for some 25 years, maybe even 30. So I knew the system really well, even for my benefit where I worked at. I was doing crime, um, stealing cars, selling drugs. My life was full of darkness, um, chaotic. I was using anything I'd get my hands on. My future looked like was just um, how I'm going to get my next books. I'm always neglected my kids, my family. I was chasing that high all the time. And then it was leading me back to square one, which was prison. I never saw a way out of that lifestyle. I thought that was the end for me, was to die taking drugs and committing crime. I didn't know how to stop, um, so my offending continued until I was given the opportunity by the judges in the drug court. I just looked at it like, here's my chance to, you know, to get out of the world that I've been in for so long. It was family orientated, so it was all about getting us back to our families, is what I saw it as. The first thing I noticed was I wasn't alone. It was just the whole spirit thing about the court, the whole structure of it. I've never felt so loved before. Everyone cared. And that's my to me. Everyone cares for everyone. These people that I didn't even know had met, you know, they were all in my corner, backing me up. So, you know, and I thought to myself, well, people have given me another chance. Perhaps I've got to give myself another chance. Other peers in the court, I got a lot of hope from them because I knew a few of them in my old lifestyle. And to have seen them change their lives was a miracle. And that was something, you know, I wanted. I want to be a part of that. So before entering the drug court, I didn't know anything about my Māori side except for I was from up north somewhere. Yeah, and I was brought up uh, around with a lot of violence. Didn't really have much contact with my um, culture. Uh, the only culture I was in contact with was the drinking culture. My relationship with my culture uh, prior to drug court was, was very minimal. And um, along the way, with my drug use and addiction, I lost that side of me. I was quite disconnected from my Māori. I really thought of it as confronting. I never had good experiences. I had a very um, chaotic, uh, violent upbringing, and so I rejected my culture. Yeah, no, my wider world was burnt to a crisp from my addiction. The tikema the judges have incorporated in the courtroom has definitely been an element that's helped me embrace what was on offer. Kauke was implemented and you know there was things Māori and so it wasn't, it didn't feel foreign. Having a judge talk to me in Māori like really blew me away. You know to actually have that interaction with the judge, it, it kind of made me feel safe. I came out of the drug court, would start to call off with a free in Māori, and after that we would have a waiata in Māori. I was quite moved. It gave me a sense of, uh, it, you know, pride, pride of who I am as Māori. Within the team, apart from the judge, you have, you know, your police prosecutor, of course, you have your defence lawyers, you have your administrative people, you have your treatment experts, you have your probation officer. But in the New Zealand model, we also have developed a unique role, pōoranga. The pōoranga is a person who is inspiring for our participants and also gives guidance to the court on matters that are appropriate. So I've been in recovery myself for 26 years, 10 months. With that personal journey, it is there that I can give back to these newcomers, to these participants, my personal experience, strength, and hope. Pauranga, in English terms, 
can be considered as a pillar of healing. Well, the Paramahurama to me is just like um, someone who stands strong and well well being. Perhaps if I can refer to the crest that sits in the courtroom, which is the coat of arms, the role of Paramahurama is taking up the warrior position. In every courtroom in the country, uh, a judge sits beneath uh, that crest, which has Māori on the one side and Pākehā on the other. Now, they are depicted as equals. They reflect to me the importance of the partnership in the delivery of justice. The judges have embraced the Treaty of Waitangi and they stand there as the door opener for the voice of Māori to be heard and to be expressed fully. You know, here is Te Ao Māori in the courtroom, uh, the place that culture, that whakapapa has in uh, the treatment journey, uh, I think that enhances the delivery of justice. Uh, the Pauwaranga, he encouraged me to go and learn Māori again. He's researched for me my family history, where I come from, and assisted me in many ways to really become a stronger person in my culture. Our Pauwaranga is uh, a man with huge mana. He is well respected in the recovery community and the treatment community, uh, and I think he brings all of that mana to the role. I think his, his role is vital for our Māori people. You know, he helped me to see the light, you know, broaden my horizons. You know, take a good look at the real world and how we fit in. I guess he, get, he showed me sense, you know, um, just with his words and um, showed kindness, but also strength um, at times for um, those that were struggling. He's given me, you know, that want to want to actually take back my culture. I look to him as a father figure. He just embraces you with all of his aroha um, to help you in any way that he can. So much respect for Matura as a strong Māori leader. What it gives them is a sense of pride, a sense of dignity. It gives them a desire to walk tall, to stand tall, to know that they do have something of worth. It ignites within them a desire to pursue their Māori tapa, to learn more about their language. If you don't know who you are, who are you? And I think that's a part of this journey, I think it's part of this whole recovery process is where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Who am I of? I just find it so profound that the common law court can be a part of my tikkun, be a part of my culture. For Māori, when they enter the court and they are welcomed in with a mihi whakatau, it puts them automatically at ease. It hits the way to work, the spirit of the person. You know, addiction lives predominantly in the head. However, when we approach it first contact from the heart, or the spirit, then it somewhat disarms one right at the first instance. Change. Is a Learning more about my my heritage has absolutely changed me. Has helped me um, develop the person that I believe I should have been from the beginning. And when I graduated, I really felt like um, my mana had been restored. I, I kind of you know, had a spiritual awakening experience from it. From the the alcohol and drug treatment court has given me the tools to be able to deal with life and be responsible.
you know, being a more responsible person in the community or being a more responsible parent. What the drug court gave me was love, strength, direction, um, the kick up the ass that I needed. What I'm most looking forward to in the future is becoming successful, contributing to society and helping other people who are struggling with addiction. The alcohol and other drug treatment court, its focus is about well-being, is about treatment to get well. You know, addiction lives in disconnect. Recovery lives in connect. Reconnecting with whānau, reconnecting with hapu, reconnecting with iwi. What attributes to that rebuilding significantly is the cultural connection. Today I am proud to be who I am and where I come from. And I guess, you know, the judges and Matua and the whole team of Drug Corp really helped me embrace that. I've got relationships, right, which I never had. I've never had any relationships. You know, so now I've got this whole network, you know, I've got this whole community. On graduating, I received <coughs> my this is a sign of respect, I guess, and a big achievement. It's a symbol of my future. You know, this green stone is always here to protect me, and I am so proud to wear this. It's a symbol of, you know, love, hope, and strength. No te rodo, naku te rodo. With your basket and with my basket, Together, we will flourish. Testing. Oh, good. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to acknowledge the graduates that you just saw on there. I like to say that I take them everywhere I go. And so, because they're the heart of the matter. And what I'm about to show you is, thank you, is um, Tori spoke of the space in between. And it's an interesting space. It's an unknown space. It's a space that is totally creative if one would trust that those who enter it are willing to be fearless, are willing to take a chance at getting it wrong. Nevertheless, they're willing to try something, use the imagination. And so, I hope, um, oh, okay, so there's two baskets there. And what that means is, this is a proverb. I'm sure you have proverbs of your own. They're important because they're your history. I encourage you to look into your people, your language, and seek out those proverbs. They're timeless, timeless. So this is one of ours. No te rodo, naku te rodo, ka ora ai te iwi. When it's loosely translated into English, with your food basket and my food basket, when we share it, ooh, we have a yummy, yummy <laughs> meal. And that's the space, is the sharing in, the, in between. So here we have the bicultural approach. The Alcohol and Other Drug Treatment Court is its English name. Its Māori name is Te Whare Whakapiki Wairua. And what that means is the house, so the court now becomes a house, the house that uplifts the spirit. Big difference, eh? Already you've got a paradigm shift. Who wants to be in the house that uplifts the spirit? Yes, please. 
so therein lies, and of course we have our, our tino ranga tiratanga flag, which is our sovereignty flag. And of course we have the, um, the colonial flag, English. So here we go, a bicultural approach to dealing with addiction, implementing concepts of the Treaty of Waitangi. Now this treaty is an interesting treaty. By the time the English got to us, they were starting to scratch their head and think, mm, maybe we need to try something different. So they decided on a treaty. And uh, the way that we practice that treaty today at home is by these three Ps. Participation. So again, we're in, we're in the middle of the space, so we've got... We've got uh, uh, we call our, our home folk Pākehā. That's, that's who they are for us at home. And then we have Māori, Pākehā, Māori. It's a bit like um, Helen and I. She's Pākehā, I'm Māori. So with us being with you, we, we come with a bicultural approach in that manner. So we say participation, let's participate together. Protection, there's some protections that need to be understood in that space as well, and partnership, partnership. You know, that's the ideal that we're always reaching for in that space. And sometimes we hit it, and a lot of times we miss it. But that's okay, that's okay. It's a creative space. So here we have, as, as uh, Judge Aiken spoke of um, in the court, we have LAW, as uh, many of our folk back home have been treated to for the 160 years now, thereabouts. And then we have LORE, law, natural law, as, um, as we would say. Um, and we call that tikanga, so the way to do the right thing. So, here we have the traditional Western model, uh, Westminster model, uh, residing in the courtroom. And this is where all the, the uh, traditional Māori knowledge is held and kept in this house here. So we call it a two-house model, again, following the theme of the bicultural approach. Now, this is the fellow that stands in between in the space. So, that's me. <laughs> Pauranga. And as, um, who said it on there? I think I said it. Uh, a pillar of healing. So, essentially, my job is to bring about healing. How do I do that? Well, first off, I've had to have gone through my own healing processes before I can start thinking that I can offer that to others. So it's got to come from within my basket before it can be handed out. So that's why I said, you know, I keep what I have, which is my healing, by giving it away. The more I give away, the more it comes back. Pretty cool, eh? I like that kind of. So what do we have here to, to have? My hope is that you may have a po oranga, or whatever that name is called, someday in your courtroom. What's the qualifying factor? Well, in the drug court, you have to have been an alcoholic or addict. First qualifier. You've got to walk the talk, in other words. You can't be someone who knows about it, but hasn't lived it. You know why? Because they'll see you a mile off and they'll go, who are you? You ain't been there. What are you trying to tell me what to do when you don't know? So don't come here telling me that. You gotta be, walk, been to the bottom, lost it all, and then come back through the process of recovery. Key. Because you know, back home, we have a lot of folk back home, men who can speak our language eloquently and have all the 
wonderful credentials. But have they been to the bottom? Mm. So, that's what the 20 years plus. When you're sitting alongside a judge and the judge is trusting you to make some calls, you better have some really good solid stuff for the judge to trust in. What does that mean? So will five years cut it? No. Ten years cut it? No. Fifteen years cut it? Ooh, getting close, but still no. Twenty years or more. Judge is going to listen. Judge is going to, he's going to trust that fella. Because it's not only coming out of his mouth, but it's coming out of his community. Because after 20 years, you've built a solid community to also be your voice. So, you know, that's the bicultural aspect. You can't just step up to the mark and put your hand up and say, hey, I'm it. No. You've got to come with evidence. And the judge will trust evidence. So, as Judge Aiken said on, on, on the uh, film, you know, mana for us in, in my language is, comes, it's almost like uh, authority. You come with authority. And so the authority of healing from my perspective and my community is the 20 years plus. And then we have uh, role models. So, like I said, you've got to walk your talk. People are watching. People are listening. You've got to be integrous with how you deliver. So that's the role modelling. Uh, when I look to the cultural aspect, Yes, I'm blessed to have been raised by my parents who were steeped in our culture. And I come from a family of 18. So we know a little bit about restorative justice in our household. <laughs> and then I have 10 children, ranging from 34 to 11. So again, a lot of stuff is learnt in that space. <clears throat> Weaving cultural strands. Now, that's an interesting one. That is, see, part of my healing process is to weave. I'm sure we've got weavers in the house, and you know what it's like to weave. A single strand is a, is, is a good place to start, but then you begin to weave another strand. So I'm talking weaving strands in the space between Māori and Pākehā that zone there. Uh, L-O-R-E practices, law practices, well, I, you know, I just did some up here before. I had to honour you all, the people of the land, because tribally that's what we do. That's just the way we live and how we deliver. Um, and that, that has a story, entire story of its own. I won't go into that because I've got a few more slides to go. So now here's the weaving. AODTC is the PO in the middle. Everything is drawn, attracted to it. So collaboration is a key player. And who's, who, who, it's judge-led. So it's the judge that leads the way, but the judge leads the way in a team approach. So these words here, what are they saying? Well, um, if I go back to that house, the marae, the two house model, and the one on, on this side, which is the marae, all those four up there, are, or three, should I say, are marae. What it means is an ancestral house, and that is where the ancestral knowledge is kept and held and delivered and performed. I'm sure you'll have one of those places for your people where you gather. I've just come from a conference in Australia and um, where, the, where many of the, the tribal Aborigines gather is under a tree. They gather under a tree and that's their gathering place where they tell their stories. Where they, and, and so I'm sure that you have those places as well. Okay, and then prayer. Yes, prayer happens three times in the court. In the morning at 8.30 when we begin at one o'clock when we begin the open court 
and at five o'clock, if it's a good day, when we close court. So it happened three times. And with it comes Waiata. We sung. I thought you did a great job too, by the way. You know, just off the bat. Um, so we we do that also. Uh, I've composed both the Waiata and the Karakia for the court. Um, haka, you saw, it's dance. You might be lucky. I might just deliver a haka for you this evening. We'll see. We'll wait and see. <clears throat> And, and the mihi whakato, this is an important one because when you enter the court and you've been determined uh, appropriate to enter, then you are welcomed, formally welcomed, in the traditional way. And that's what I, I, I meant uh, on, the, on the video about, you know, disarming, disarming, because you're coming, now you're coming into a real foreign way of doing things as opposed to the traditional Westminster way uh, because now your culture's coming straight at you and that's, whoa, what's going on here? <clears throat> okay, moving on. So cultural processes in the AODTC. I, as I mentioned, that's the, that's the formal welcome. Māori language is received again. You heard... The judge speaks Māori. The judge goes to learn Māori. Um, prayer, that's karakia over there. Humane, that song, spiritual song, as it's seen there. And then we have these three taonga. Symbolism is really important. Symbolism. And so these uh, three symbols here represent serenity, courage, wisdom. You know, I want to take a moment just right now to really honour the United States of America, you all. I want to honour you for the work that you have done for the last 30 years in crafting and forging the way forward for drug courts to exist. We were very, very fortunate that our judges came from New Zealand over here. They saw the model. And I want to make mention of um, Judge Peggy Hora. I want to honour her. Uh, at this time. She has been such a, um, a light for us where we are and uh, she c today she continues to support the development of our courts back home. But you all, you know, we came to this late. 30 years on we've, we've just come to this and we've been blessed to have the best practice approach that you all have developed over that amount of time and then you've, you've handed it to us and says, here, go to it. So thank you. I want to thank you for, for you know, doing the hard yards that now we can come and, and give what we have in order to continue to grow together, together. Because I do hope that, you know, what you're seeing this evening that you may see something in there for yourselves that you might say, oh yeah, we could maybe consider that, consider that. It's a giving back. It's a giving back to you all. That this is all, that's what this is all about. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is, comes from the 12 step of, 12 step program of Alcoholics and Narcotics Anonymous. Again, began here. And so, when they enter the court, I speak to them about serenity. You're entering into a journey. And this journey is a new way of being. And you're going to, in order to have this way of being occur for you, it's going to take serenity. Our hope is that, even if you don't know that word now, by the time you leave this house, you will know that word. You will be walking that word in your life. What does it take to have serenity in your life? It takes surrender. It takes trust. It takes admitting. It takes accepting. These are the elements that they hear to begin with, even though they're going, oh, yeah, right, right. Nevertheless, they're hearing it for the first time. Courage. Courage for what? To be open, honest, willing, and transparent. 
These are the conversations that they encounter when they first step into the courtroom and are being welcomed in. Of course, it's all done in a loving way. Wisdom, an act of wisdom that we often resound in our quarters, do the next right thing. That's an act of wisdom. You mess up, do the next right thing. What does that mean? What, how do I do the next right thing? You pick up the phone and you ring and you talk to us. Talk to us. Don't forget, though, we're dealing with a disease of denial. Denial. So, repetition is the mother of skill. So we must be repetitive in our language and our conversations until it drops. Until then, we keep saying, keep saying, keep saying. And over here we have uh, the kete. The kete represents the weaving again, the basket that weaves, that in there sits the knowledge. And in this particular case, the knowledge that sits in there is um, the Just for Today uh, in a book that, again, someone in the morning before karakia, or sorry, after karakia, will do a reading, today's reading. Why is that? So that the judge, the team, will have a sense of what folk are engaging in outside of the court on their journey of recovery. Okay, better move. Te ropu kākano, sowing the seeds of change. Where does it begin? In custody, because that's where our folk start from. Even though you've been determined, you've got to wait because our treatment beds are full. So you've got to wait in custody until the treatment pathway opens up. <clears throat> what do you learn in there as a starter? Well, that's where you begin to learn the song that we sing in the court, learn the prayer that we say in the court. So that's where all these consistencies begin. Te whare tapafa, I'll touch on that. So what that means is the four walls of the house. And it goes like this. Here's the four walls. One, two, three, four, in order for this roof to, to stand. So that wall there is, I'm going to name it tonight, as the physical wall. What does that mean? It means everything that you need to do physically, eat well, exercise, all, all those aspects of wellness that your physicalness needs. That's that wall there, okay? That wall back there, I'm going to call that wall the mind. The mind needs to be reprogrammed. So how do we do that? Well, again, we use those readings, get along to meetings, for example. That's the reprogramming. So that, that's taking care of the mind, okay? And then um, over here on this wall, I'm going to call it the spiritual wall. So this wall is about, okay, wh where's my spiritual connection at? Do I have one? And if not, how can I get one? So it's about the spiritual. It could be, you know, being in nature, watching a sunset, watching a sunrise, all those things, getting that sense of connectedness spiritually in you. So that's that wall. Now this wall, we call it farno, but it's actually community. Community. And farno in our language means family. Family. When those four walls are in balance, your house stands firm. Any one of those out of balance, the roof's going to lean one side. One way, maybe that way, who knows? Might be the physical way, because you're going too hard out physically. Might be the spiritual way, because you're not doing enough. But it's about balance, looking for balance, so that the roof will stand. Um, they write personal reflection journals that goes direct to the judge. And so it's, it's a, uh, as soon as they're ready to hand it to me, I say, okay. I'll take it, and then I give it to judge in court. Judge reads, and uh, 
and then uh, does a comment and it goes back. So the communication direct with judge and with the participant is occurring. Tuakana Taina, if I can just touch on that, that means older brother, younger brother, older sister, younger sister, role model, role modelling. Those who are a little further along the journey are role modelling to those who are just entering the journey. So they go, who better to role model than your own? Oh, gee, they're doing it a great way. And of course, ko io means, who am I? Who am I? Oh, sorry, let me go back. Another proverb. He kākanoa hau i ruia mai i rangi atea. A seed of greatness sown in the heavens. So they've got to remember that they're greatness. They're forgotten. They've got caught in the layers and the layers and the layers. So we take them back to the source. What is the source? It's a seed. A seed of what? A seed of greatness. Now let's begin to live and grow that seed of greatness. So out in the community, I run another group, and that is here. Um, and this is, a, this is, I call it the ABC of um, my work. So the A means A team. If you're tracking on the A team, you get out of court early. You're, you're doing great. So that's the A team there to graduation. And what does it take to be on the A team? You better show up to court. Meet your testing obligations. Do your meetings, AANA and the programs that are your pathway, whatever that pathway may be. This group is called um, taking care of the little things. When you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. So it's about taking care of the little things. So that's why the A is a little fella. The B is a lot bigger. That's life stuff. That's distractions from what we're focusing on. So often they get caught up in the B space. And we say to them, guys, trust. Trust that if you track here, the ripple effect will impact there. The ripple, you've got to trust. You can't see it now, but it will if you keep doing this line here. And so there are those that, uh, you know, have a moment of lapse and say, oh, I forgot. You keep doing that, you end up in C. Custody, of course is what C is, and uh, that's the cycle. What we want to do is bring them back out here. So we look to transform that C into using this language, connect, commit, communicate, clarity, consistency, care, courage, community, anything to do with C, we put it up there. <laughs> And that little fellow up there, he's an interesting fellow because he's the fellow that gets you in there and uh, I'll leave it up to your imagination as to what BS means. <laughs> Tell a bit of BS. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, great. This is another group that I run. Now, this is, now I'm in treatment. Now I'm in the treatment program at Papatoma to Higher Ground. I do weekly check-ins with our participants that are in the court. And, um, you know, I look at, we talk about, so this is circle, we're sitting circle now. And uh, awarenesses, challenges, breakdowns, breakthroughs, peer feedback, so everyone's giving, giving some contribution to each other. Uh, again, uh, role modelling, the older brother, younger brother, support. And, of course, who am I? And uh, this, is, this is the serenity prayer in Māori. E te atua, tukua mai he ngāko mahaki, God grant me the serenity. Boy, do you need it in treatment. So that's that kete there. This one here is another group. Now this is a very interesting group here. And it, it uh, entails about 250. That's how large this group gets. And what it is essentially is a celebration. Every six months... We celebrate twice a year graduation, those who have graduated the court. And everyone, all the stakeholders come together to be a part of that celebration. It's a big deal. It, it really is. It's fantastic. 
Um, and how we do that is everyone is gifted a ponamu, which is what the stone is. And for us back home, this is the energy stone that we, we um, trust to that carries the life force, or modi as we would say. Um, so that's the ponamu, the green stone here. And that's what they get. <coughs> um, I also hold bi-monthly meetings with that group as well. Um, so essentially the group is about 30, 25, 30. Uh, but on the bike, um, twice a year, as I say, all stakeholders come together. And um, the proverb there is, e hara taku toa i te taki tahi he toa taki tini, which means it is not by my efforts alone that I stand here, but by that of many. So it is the many that have me succeed. This one here, so this is a grove of, of, um, of Cody tree. It's, it's our tough tree. And um, <clears throat> what this talks about is boots on the ground. So boots on the ground means the, the worker, the one who, the donkeys. And so <clears throat> the Pau Oranga has to have the ability and the diversity to walk on the ground, but then also to sit alongside judge and everything else in between. So it's, it's, a, it's a sliding, uh, it's a very fluid uh, role that is occurring. It's a very community role that occurs, connectedness. And um, so we have, as for cultural advisors, Māori and Pacific Island managers, practitioners, support workers, we all come together and we all support one another. So that proverb is, afi mai, afi atu, tato, tato e, supporting each other together. Very important, that one, because, you know, when we're isolated, get stuff. <clears throat> environment, another key player is the environment. And on this one here, I heard the I am conversation today. So at home, we always say, I am the river and the river is me. I am the mountain and the mountain is me. We take ownership of the environment. We have to. And so in this, so there's our mountain, one of our mountains there. It's Rangitoto is that mountain out there. And that is a day, a community work day, where all our participants go and give back to the community, give back, go and put a bit of sweat into the community. Uh, and then, of course, community gardens, a native nursery, um, planting natives. This one on the right here, she's our deputy mayor. So again, we're fortunate to have champions all the way through that connect the dots. So it's not an isolated space. It's very much a collective space that everyone is working on. <clears throat> so here we have the uh, Māori recovery community that's been, this has been running for 26 years. Self-supporting, not into funding, just make it happen. And so, so the, that's what happens. This is our local whānau back in Auckland, he waka e kinoa, and, um, and what they do is they practice again along cultural, but also the blend. So you've got culture, you've got 12 step. See, it's a blend. We're always looking to blend. We're not saying we got the answer, not at all. We've got to partner this, we've got to work together on this. And these are some of the Māori stakeholders that support uh, the work that we do. We have a proverb down here, he tangata, what is the most important thing? It is people, it is people, it is people. That's another proverb. This one here, th here's some stats that, um, that were given to me before I come here because I said, team, I need to take some stats of some sort. So 
as of October just gone, we've had a total number of 517 participants move through the court since 2012 when we began on the 1st of November. You w you'll remember on the DVD um, we showed the first graduate in 2014, 18-month program in the court, another 18 months with corrections beyond the court. Because we say three plus years up to five, when you get to five years, you've got a pretty good chance of continuing on. So we want to hold them as long as we can and then back out, back out, back out. Um, and actually, they, they, they desire to stay with us too because they feel a bit vulnerable when they step out of, out of there. So total number of graduates has been 204 to date. Total number of exits, 313. Uh, total number of participants graduated, 39.4%. I think that's pretty cool. That's, you know, getting there, getting there. Uh, total number of participants exited, 606 so, as it says down here, graduated, that's, that's the figure really, that's the key one, 39.4% um, is what's... Last slide. Um, so, looking ahead, looking ahead. I think for me, looking ahead is about, again, weaving the strands so that there is confidence on both, in both camps in both camps. And I highly recommend that you have the people amongst you. You know who they are. I'm sure you do. You just haven't thought of them perhaps in this light. But they're key people and they are there. You know, the question was asked to me, well, what about your role? What if you're not there? Who's gonna, you know, how can we have one of you here? was the question asked. Well, you've got to start somewhere. Humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. So at the, at the moment, we're, we're training up those who have come through the court, they've now graduated, and now they are the seeds that are being grown back home. Meanwhile, do we wait for them? No, we don't. We just work in partnership. So now that I'm over here, judge does my role. We have lawyers in there that, that also take, who speak Māori, they take on the role, so they take portions of it. It's a shared role. It's a shared role when I'm not there. Anyway, I've been given the nod. So I hope you've got something out of this. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Do you want me to dance for you? You do? Because we dance in our court too. Okay. I've done a bit of singing lately, but I haven't done much dancing. And I'm not a Michael Jackson either. <laughs> oh. Gee, hooked up. Um, so I composed this haka. A haka is a war dance, and this dance is, uh, it's the, this one actually is a, a dance of encouragement. So if I can just explain it, then I'll do it for you. And um, what it speaks of is, firstly, the house is named. So remember I spoke about I am the river, the river is me. Well, I am the house that uplifts the spirit. And the house is me. So, so I name the house first. And then I go, then the next portion of it is, is tu tangata means to stand tall. Tu wairua means to tall in the spirit. Kyakaha, kyakaha means to be strong to be encouraging. Kia kaha, kia kaha, kia manawa, manawa, so the action will go like this, and that means to be open-hearted. That's the action of being open-hearted, to give and to receive. And then, hiyo, oh, 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 
is like an exclamation mark, exclamation mark, and another exclamation mark. One's not enough. And then the last sounding out is tihe modi ora. And what that means is let the life force flow. Ripple, 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 ripple. Okay? So this is how it goes. Make sure nothing falls out. Te whare wakapiki wairua, tūta nūra, aia, ha, ha. Tūta ngata, tūta So when youth court, it's a separate, completely separate jurisdiction to drug court. That's just for adults, but they do learn tikanga and they come onto the marae for uh, Māori youth can come onto a marae and learn about tikanga there. But we don't have the same. We don't have that role. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so court for the youth is actually taken into the ancestral house. So the judge moves everyone into the house has the elders, has everyone placed there and then works with them in that manner within the ancestral house. Yeah. I would respond by saying this, tap into your local sources. They are there, you, but you'll only know where they are because you're looking for them. You've got to go looking for them and, and they'll show themselves and it, it, it may sound as basic and as simple as that, but that's actually how it happens. They become drawn drawn from here, because this is where you want it to come from. You don't want it to be coming from here just to be able to, you know, deliver such. It's got to be 
a heart attraction. And, and that's that life force that I mentioned that already exists. It's just who's going to be courageous enough to sound out and then watch what comes and who comes to fill the space. They'll come. <laughs>